Thank you, Cruz. It's, uh, it's great to be back here. And um, thank you, Cruz and Natalie, also for letting me be part of the studio this afternoon. Uh, Cruz and Natalie have actually taught me that optimism, which I was losing uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and I, I hope you, those of you that are subjected to them here, uh, realize quite how rare it is to have the kind of energy and inventiveness and just pure joy of discovering even horrible things that they are able to convey. It's uh, your, your privilege to have them here. Uh, so I, I hope you all get to enjoy their work. Um, I do have to warn you, and if any of you after this warning want to skip out and uh, start happy hour Friday early, that's fine by me. Um, I gave a lecture here a couple of years ago, which was lots and lots of pretty pictures. Uh, I have some pretty pictures today, but this is really um, a idea lecture. And uh, after the first couple of slides, um, we'll have a per performance from Cruz Garcia playing visual DJ or, or slide J, whatever it would be, uh, just kind of riffing on what I'm talking about in the rhythm in which he's going to show the images. So I'm not going to talk directly about most of the, the images. Um, but all of my work, and I think that's true for most of us, is in a certain sense autobiographical. So I did want to start with uh, these slides. Uh, the actual book uh, that uh, Cruz was holding up, uh, I think it's uh, $39.95 at Amazon. And you're, what, what's it? Order two? She ordered two already. Oh, oh my god. So you can steal one from her. Um, yeah, they're, it's way too expensive. But uh, anyhow, it's, uh, it's the result of 20 years of teaching theory classes uh, con it condensed in a book. But the roots of it uh, really go back much further. Um, and the images I'm showing you here will be very unfamiliar, I assume, to all of you, uh, because they're from the Netherlands, which is where I wound up uh, growing up after we moved there when I was about four years old. And when I entered into the equivalent of middle school, I went to a place uh, called the Werkplatz Kindergemeenschap, which literally translated means the Working Place Children's Community. It was a very experimental school, or had been, it had become more formalized, that was started by Quakers that believed that art and um, helping to feed chickens and clean up after cows was part of your education. And uh, the teachers were called the co-workers and the students were the workers. And you called them all by their first name, which was very radical in that part of the world. But what mattered even more than what the school, how the school operated to me, was that I was the first year to be in the finished building on the left, which was, that's just the front of a very large modernist complex that spread across uh, an acre or two of land around a series of courtyards with hallways and classrooms made out of brick and glass and wood and tile, glazed tile. And there was this sense that you had entered into a new world here, that you were becoming part of a community in which the visibility of every material, the clarity of every form, the structure and rhythm of the places you were inhabiting allowed you to understand the world in a more logical sense. And it was very inspiring to me uh, in a very deep way. And the same year, um, the building on the left opened, uh, sorry, on the right opened. Are any of you here from the Netherlands? I doubt it, but, well, you live there. Yeah, but you live there too late, so. Um, well, yeah, but this, when this opened in 73, I think 73, I think was the year it opened, 75. Um, it's uh, called Hochkaltrain, it's a shopping mall. But I had watched this thing be built. They took this, this medieval city 
that had this 19th century addition or expansion between the old medieval part and the train station, like many cities in Europe, that was just slums and whorehouses and rundown stores and everything else. They just cut it all loose, tore it all down, drove a highway through the middle of it, and then raised a shopping mall on the second level, floating over all of this. And you entered from the medieval city into this skylit hall of marble and chrome and then wandered through these labyrinthine paths until you suddenly, miraculously, without stopping at a single stoplight or seeing a single slum, arrived in the train station. And again, this to me was such a miraculous appearance, this notion that architecture could create another world, a floating world, where everything was possible. Little did I know, the architects were very inspired by some of the thinkers of the 60s, uh, particularly a guy called Constant, who imagined a world of continual floating play that would arise over the dead carpuses of the old cities of Europe. And also by, next slide please, Professor Cruz. Oh, I have to, oh, I'll do it. Um, also, now you can, after this, you get to do your thing. Um, one of the rituals I have with my father, um, who was, uh, both my parents were English professors, and my father and I would go in, on Sunday to that train station, and we would drive there from the outskirts of Utrecht where we lived, and we would pick up the English newspapers, uh, Sunday English newspapers. It was a big ritual to read those in this strange Dutch country. And um, one day we picked them up, and I got back the car, and I opened up the art section of the largest of all of the newspapers in England, and there was this. Uh, an image of the walking city, this idea that there could be this community that was just going to walk across the Atlantic Ocean from London and arrive somewhere around New York. And I thought, isn't this exciting? Couldn't this be a different reality? And so I got into architecture. Of course, it took a little bit longer than that, and then it involved a few more steps. But I got into architecture because I thought I was going to build new worlds like this. Of course, it didn't turn out like this, and you can start rotating now, because I soon began to realize that the destruction that these kind of buildings involved um, had consequences that were not so great. And the building of these kind of perfect structures, including my school, soon fell apart um, as social orders changed and as they were used. Hochkulturelle became synonymous with drug use and gangs and really all kinds of horrible stuff going on there. And my school was, after only being in existence for only 20 years or 25 years, was torn down and replaced with a more efficient, compact structure. So I realized that it wasn't so easy to just dream of other worlds, but something more profound happened, which is that I began reading my theory and realizing that what drove the production of these kind of utopias was a form of avoidance. I bet you that all of you somewhere in the deepest recesses of your brains, and maybe even in the frontal lobes of your brains, are dreaming of building a perfect world, of building an architecture that will be so perfect and so all-encompassing that we will live in perfect harmony forever and ever, with no class distinctions, race distinctions, sexual distinctions. Everything will be perfect. And you have to realize, I think, that every time that those kind of utopias are implemented, they turn out to be horrible. They turn out to 
lie on top of people's lives and cities with an inherent violence that reflects that the only people capable of constructing them are the state or those people acting in the name of the state who have abrogated the power of the state, very wealthy people. Now that's a well-known story. I think, I hope by now that you have already learned, even those of you in your second year, that the path to utopia is not only littered with corpses, but that utopia itself is a monument to death and destruction rather than being the embodiment of a better world. But the same is true in a smaller scale as well, which is I was one of the few people, it turned out, who had the genetic defect that let me love the school and the shopping mall with which I started this talk. Most people, even when they were opened and brand spanking new, found them alien, other, weird, uncomfortable. All words that describe architecture that is not familiar, meaning made out of forms we already know, that is not already well-worn and welcome to the touch, and, and this is very important, has not been put together over time, piece by piece, embodying within it the complexities of lives and histories that went into its making, and thereby becoming something of which we become part. The world of architecture, I hate to tell you, as you're learning it at this school, is one that is rejected by most people who have not been indoctrinated or brainwashed into architecture. And I'll tell you a little local story that was one of my realizations of this. Years ago, I had the most wonderfully well-paying job as a side gig uh, working for Metropolitan Home, which was actually published right out of here in Des Moines, Iowa, which is the only reason I went to Iowa. And they paid me $20,000 a year to do almost nothing, uh, which back then was a huge amount of money. And I just wrote an article so now and then for them, and that was about it. Uh, and had to come to Des Moines and do things like go to a focus group. So the focus group I went to was they called in a bunch of people and they laid copies of Metropolitan Home. Now, Metropolitan Home is something of a sort of magazine that doesn't exist anymore. It, it, they used to be called shelter books. They were magazines that you would buy, physical magazines you would buy at a store that showed pictures of pretty houses. And people, it was like, it was like shelter porn. Um, it was what people thought their houses maybe should look like. Architectural Digest is the one that's the only one I think that's still around being actually published. So Metropolitan Home was the one that was supposed to be the hipper one that actually showed modern architecture. And they did this focus group. And the focus group means that you're sitting in a room with a one-way mirror, they can't see you, and people are sitting around the table with copies of the magazine, and they're going over the magazine going, oh yeah, that was a great piece because I really like that French colonial look, whatever French colonial is, but I really love that look and you know, it's so accessible and the other person said, well, it's okay, but you know, we really, something American, like more like the colonial American, that's what really we love. Uh, or, or maybe, you know, the, the fantasy of a kind of California Spanish revival and they were talking about the various things that they liked, and the one thing they could all agree on was that they hated anything that looked like modern architecture. It's nothing to do with our lives. It's cold, it's meaningless, it's just the fantasy of some big macho architect somewhere trying to get us to live in a certain way. Don't show us any more of this modern architecture. So I was out of a job because that's what I specialized in. And in thinking about all this deeper and deeper, um, I came more or less to the, I came to the conclusion, which is not my conclusion. Uh, if you read the book, you will see all the footnotes of the people who actually came up uh, with this interpretation, that utopia and dystopia 
is a profound psychological problem architects are addressing. And that means, by that I mean this. Um, architects are trained that they are going to make a better world and that their architecture will be perfect and beautiful and will last forever and then they will have succeeded. As it turns out, as I'm sure many of you already know, when you go into the practice of architecture, you are not building your perfect world. You are, have to engage in a form of transference. You have to, which is a psychological term, you have to imagine that you are your client and build their fantasy, their desires, their wants. You are always trying to build what the person with the means, the money and the power, wants built and wants for themselves. And that means that architecture always has been, is and always will be, the built affirmation of the social, economic, and political status quo. Now, that then leads the architect with a problem. Here I am doing all this creative work, but the AIA tells me, and I sign off on this, that I'm in a service profession and that my job is to satisfy my clients. That's what the AIA says that you should be doing as an architect. And I can try to steal little moments that are, you know, me, that are like whatever drip I have that I'm going to give to this project. But basically, I am trying to live my life through the architect who has given me the job to build their life. Very strange role reversal. So what do I do? Well, I go off in evenings and weekends and I make theoretical projects. I make projects that embody everything I wanted to do. And I pay for the drawing paper or the computer that I use to make them with the wages I get by doing unsustainable office buildings for evil corporations or doing house additions for my neighbors. Might be the same thing, but let's not think about that too much. Um, so, utopia is an escape me mechanism, and dystopia, like some of the science fiction films you've been seeing, is a kind of double avoidance, realizing that utopia is impossible, so instead saying, I know better, and I'm going to show you how bad I am. Very perverse, all of this way of acting. But that is what has become the engine of architecture, this sideline in utopias and dystopias whose ideas then supposedly percolate down into architecture so that you can think that some part of the buildings you're making, that little skylight there, that exposed column over here, are building blocks or promissory notes for the utopia that someday in your mind you're going to build somewhere. So obviously I said, now, this is an absurd situation. So what else is possible? What other worlds are possible? And I started, funnily enough, with a text by Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, this was both long before I wound up at Taliesin having to live in Frank Lloyd Wright, which is a whole other lecture I could give. Um, but also, long before Frank Lloyd Wright became the kind of master of the universe wannabe that he was for most of his life. The Frank Lloyd Wright who wrote um, Art and Craft of the Machine had just turned 30, sorry, no, was still under 30, and was a political radical who gave this speech at a place called Hull House, which was a um, settlement house in Chicago that was a center for the women's movement, for class struggle, for all kinds of places of fighting against the then rampant capitalism of Chicago, then and now rampant capitalism of Chicago. And in this speech, Frank Lloyd Wright turns to another tradition, one that 
you can sum up with the name arts and crafts, though it has various versions and kinds of being. But these were communities that first sprang up in England in the 1860s and then uh, spread throughout the world, very strong in America, that were uh, intentional communities where people believed that by making things from the implement you use to cook to the chair you sat, sit on to the houses you inhabited, you could p build a better world piece by piece. And there was a political dimension to this. You would not use money, you would trade goods. Uh, the idea of making the world together was the main economic and cultural activity all rolled into one. And people experimented very much with this. And Frank Lloyd Wright, speaking in 1905, many years after it was, uh, that movement had started, was well aware that maybe that was too romantic a notion and that it couldn't survive in uh, capitalism. But he instead suggested that we should think of arts and crafts communities as a kind of school, as a kind of place where even if we not permanently removed ourselves to make things together, we could gather together to learn how to make things together and understand different modes of realities that might be possible. A little bit like he wound up doing 20 years later uh, when he started Taliesin. And the text walks through in a few pages uh, what such a world might look like and what its attributes might be. And it also places it very strongly in a tradition that includes not just the arts and crafts community, politically includes anarchism and political movements like that, but also in terms of architecture and art includes the notion of collage the notion that you gather together things rather than imposing uh, an order on the world, the notion that architecture is a kind of hunting and gathering, that it is a gathering into unconcealment of what already exists, and you'll hear that phrase again a little bit later, uh, that it is a continual form of revelation and reimagination. He has a whole passage where he talks about not putting decoration on things, but finding decoration within the nature of materials. And this is a very articulate and, and clearly stated by then, um, but by then fairly well-known statement of why we needed this kind of arts and crafts community. And then in the edition that I read, and in most editions, they managed to do this. You turn the page, and it's like he has suddenly stopped this argument. So he's been making this argument for arts and crafts, and you can imagine him drawing his breath, turning over his notes, and suddenly saying, be gently uplifted at nightfall to the top of a great downtown office building, and yet you may see how in the image of material man, at once his glory and menace, is this thing we call a city. You think, okay, he's going to describe the antithesis of the arts and crafts community. But then he goes on. There beneath, grown up, in the night is the monster Leviathan stretching acre upon acre into the far distance. High overhead hangs a stagnant pall of its fetid breath, reddened with the lights from its myriad eyes, endlessly everywhere blinking. Ten thousand acres of cellular tissue, layer upon layer, the city's flesh outspreads and meshed by intricate networks of veins and arteries radiating out into the gloom, and there, with muffled, persistent roar, pulses and circulated as the blood in your veins, the ceaseless beat of the activity to whose necessity it all conforms. Now suddenly, the city has become an animal, a beast, a giant land whale. But then, 
like to the sanitation of the human body is the drawing off of poisonous waste from the system of this enormous creature, absorbed first by the infinitely ramifying thread-like ducts gathered at their sensitive terminals, matter destructive to its life, hurrying it to millions of small intestines, intestines to be collected in turn by larger, flowing to the great sewer, on to the drainage canal, and finally to the ocean. This 10,000 acres of flesh-like tissue is again knit and interknit with a nervous system marvelously complete, delicate filaments for hearing, knowing, almost feeling the pulse of its organism, acting upon the ligaments and tendons for motive impulse in all flowing the impelled fluid of man's life. It's a human being. It's a city. It's a human being. It's a monster. It's nerve ganglia, the peerless, coreless tandems whirling their hundred-ton flywheels fed by gigantic rows of water tube boilers burning oil, a solitary man slowly pacing backward and forward, regulating here and there the little feed valves, controlling the deafening roar of the flaming gas while beyond the incessant clicking, dropping, wading, lifting, wading, shifting of the governor gear controlling these modern Goliathans seems a visible brain in intelligent action registered infallibly in the enormous magnets purring in the great embrace of great induction coils generating the vital current meeting with instant response in the rolling cars on elevated tracks 10 miles away where the glare of the Bessemer steel converter makes a conflagration of the crowds. It's a machine. It's all of these. Somehow, in this language, and I'm chopping it up here, but if you read the original, you will see him floating between or through images of a city, a machine, a monster, a human being, all become one. It's an image of what our reality has become that no longer distinguishes between animate and inanimate, between human and human made, between what is acting on us and what we are acting, what we are doing to act. And finally, all the way at the end of it, he says, this is a thing into which the forces of art are to breathe the thrill of ideality, a soul. He calls it a forerunner of democracy. Democracy for him at that point meaning everything that our society should be. Frank Lloyd Wright's vision is not of something that should be built or should not be built, that perhaps even could be built. It's rather an evocation of something that may exist in the future, might exist at some point in the past, or might be existent right now. We just don't know where it exists. It is, in other words, a completely mythic image and when I was uh, growing up again, to go back to my childhood, uh, I had to learn ancient Greek because I went to, I was in school in the Netherlands. And there's a tense in Greek, which my teacher then taught me, and I love this, is used only for myths, only for the telling of myth. And it's called the aorist. I've since then asked other classes, and they've told me that my teacher was full of baloney, but I'm sticking to this story because it's great. And the aorist is a tense that's not future tense or past tense or present tense. It's exactly the tense where you don't know the time. You don't know whether it's something that happened, the myth, at some point in the past, long gone now or still going on to this day, might happen in the future or might have happened, be happening already. It is this world that acts as a kind of other to what we have today. 
And I became fascinated with the notion that other worlds, to steal a phrase from certain professors here, other worlds exist. Other worlds are out there. Other worlds are waiting for us to smell them, to dance them, to sex them, to do whatever it is that we have to do to become aware of their often quite fleeting reality. And I began finding these kind of other worlds throughout 20th century architecture, but also literature, philosophy, painting. Uh, one of the favorite ones that I will just throw in here, just sort of out of order, uh, was a book that I had read way before then um, that was by an a author, a fiction author called Ishmael Reed. And he wrote a book called Mumbo Jumbo. And in that book, he imagined that um, black Americans, when they came over, mainly from Africa, brought with them a secret society that had actually built the pyramids and that had conceived huge empires, some of which Western uh, history knows about, others of which it does not, and that those networks had wormed their way into America and were held together mainly by music and by dancing, but popped up in secret places uh, all around America. And here is his description of one of those pop-ups in Harlem. And I actually, he gives a very specific address, and I looked it up, and it's, from our view, just townhouses. But here's his description of it. Papalabas Mumbo Jumbo Cathedral is located at 119 West 136th Street. The dog at his heels, Papalabas, climbs the steps of the townhouse. He moves from room to room, the dark tower room, the weary blues room, the groove bang and jive around room the as-we-lay room. In the groove bang and jive around room, people are rubber lecking for dear life, bending over backward to admit their loa. In the dark tower room, artists using cornmeal and water are drawing veves, markings which were invitation to new loas for new art. The room is decorated in black and gold. A piano recording plays Jelly Roll Morton's Pearls, haunting, melancholy, melancholy. In the as-we-lay room, the drums sleep after they've been baptized. A guard attendant stands by so that they won't get up and walk all over the place. Papa Labas opens his hollow obea stick and gives the drums a drink of bootlegged whiskey. Stunned by the burbalung's attack upon him as an anachronism, he has introduced some yoga techniques. In the, in the one main room, People are doing the cobra, the fish, the lion, the lotus, the tree, the voyeur's pose, the depth pose, the wheel pose, the crow's pose, and many others. There is a room Papa Labes calls a mango room, so, known, so named to honor the great purifying plant. On a long table, maple table covered with splendid white linen cloth, rest 21 trays filled with such delectable items, etc., etc., etc. All of this then goes on for another five pages. Uh, to describe this world that could not possibly, by our reckoning, exist in the townhouse at 119 uh, West 136th Street, but that in the world of mumbo-jumbo um, exists in all of those places. And that particular kind of other world shows up in places as I said, all over the place. It certainly is one way, for instance, that when I lived in L.A., I understood a lot of Los Angeles. And it certainly is one way that you can look at the original Blade Runner and some of the other fantasy movies that came out of that kind of L.A. But it also has a version or set of versions that are not just uh, rhythmic and, if you will, pleasant, which already was true about the Frank Lloyd Wright one. Another one of my favorites is um, 
a little story that the architect Arata Izuzaki wrote when he was uh, still a young man. Um, Arata Izuzaki had been part, and you've seen some of his images float by here, um, had been part of uh, the first generation to come of age after the Second World War, and what for Japan was most important about that was, of course, the incredible destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that incredible wasteland that it produced. And Metabolist wanted to build a replacement new world, but Isuzaki was already getting quite dubious about that undertaking. And so he wrote this story when he was still a member of this group called the Metabolists that was a, a kind of a utopian movement. And he introduces this story by saying um, that one day he was walking along and he ran into an old childhood friend. And they greeted each other and caught up with each other. And Isuzaki said, I've become an architect. And what about you? His friend, whose name, it turns out, is another name for Isuzaki in Japanese, uh, said, I have become an urban assassin. Uh, sorry, no, he said, I have become an assassin. And I'm a professional assassin. And he went on to describe being an assassin as being absolutely central for the logical working of the modern world. And the more Isuzaki listens to him, the more he decides that that's what he is as an architect. He is an urban assassin. The careful long-term planning and scheming of a murder well done, as well as a perfect disposal of the body. It was just like an artist engaged in designing. Without the snobbery of Flancourt Wright or the bluff of Le Corbusier, he could produce a complicated vision in which, while extinction was coupled with existence, the concept of emptiness was caught in the middle of action. And the Japanese word for emptiness, ma, is not just emptiness, but a, but a productive kind of void. And so he says that he is going to start the City Demolition, Inc. The aim of the company, therefore, was to destroy cities by all possible means. Tokyo, for him, was especially easy to undermine. It was like a building whose foundations had decayed, walls collapsing and water pipes getting thinner, structures barely standing, braced by numerous struts, and supported by a jungle of props and buttresses, patches and stains from the leaks in the roof. It's a version of Frank Lloyd Wright's monster Leviathan, but it already exists in Tokyo. All that Izuzaki is doing is exactly what Frank Lloyd Wright called for, which is breathing in a soul to this monster Leviathan. And it turns out that some of the most important, uh, or to me, most interesting visions that wheedle their way through 20th century architecture have that quality of combining elements of utopian dystopia with fragments of existing life and a kind of hedonistic standpoint Archigram has it, Constance du Babylon have it, a lot of the other images you've been seeing here, with a kind of collage sensibility that runs through all of them, but also with a kind of violence. And here I turned to the work of Walter Benjamin, who in an essay that if you haven't been made to read, I'm sure, have you made them read? Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction? Well, we'll talk about it. Talk about it, okay. Any of the other faculty, who, the Nestors who are there in the back row, have you made them read it yet? No, not yet? All right. You'll read it at some point, trust me. Anyhow, it's famous for uh, the way that it redefines what art is. But the passage that I love is the following. Our bars and our city streets, our offices and our furnished rooms, our railroad stations and our factories, 
seem to close relentlessly around us. Then came film and exploded this prism world with the dynamite of the split second so that now we can set off calmly on journeys of adventure among its far-flung debris. With a close-up, space expands. With slow motion, movement is extended. And just as enlargement not merely clarifies what we see indistinctly in any case, but brings to light entirely new structures of matter, slow motion not only reveals familiar aspects of movement, but discloses quite unknown aspects within them, aspects which do not appear as a retarding of natural movements, but have a curious, gliding, floating character of our own. And he goes on to describe that a new psychology, a kind of psychoanalysis of the city is created by something that is not a monster leviathan, a human being, a city, and a machine, but that is a movie, an explosion, and a piece of psychoanalysis all rolled into one. So you can find another version of your urban environment if you explode it, and you can explode it with film, and if you psychoanalyze it, which is why years later Bernard Toomey said to create great architecture you might even have to uh, commit a murder. Now, I'm not suggesting you commit a murder, but maybe some form of explosion and psychoanalysis might be appropriate to think about. And there actually are specific ways uh, of doing that, that not all are necessarily uh, just violent. Another person I turn to who is uh, difficult to quote because he was a Nazi, uh, but who wrote a very interesting text um, called The Question Concerning Technology, is uh, the philosopher, um, who, I'm trying to find my right quote. I can't find the place of it. Uh, um, Martin Heidegger. Where's my Heidegger quote? I've lost my Heidegger quote. Um, all right, well, I might not be able to give you that quote because I seem to have mislaid it. But anyhow, I know. You, you took that out, right, on, on purpose. Um, so Heidegger, in The Question Concerning Technology, um, describes the way that technology has screwed us all and has turned us into what he calls standing reserve which is to say we are no longer human beings, we are human potential. Uh, we are human resources, and in fact, that's what we are if you ask any company here. And we are thus become part of the machine. Uh, we are not just controlling the machine, we have become part of the machine. And that in so doing, we don't just uh, work with the land, we challenge forth all of nature. We are continually killing nature by digging it open, plowing it, building on it, and we are also killing our own nature by challenging us to become part of technology, to become standing reserve. And it's a very bleak picture that describes the complete takeover of the world by technology turning us into just cogs in the machine. But at the end of it, in the quote I will spare you, uh, he describes, he says, where the greatest danger lies, there also lies the possibility of salvation. And what he proposes is not an explosion, but rather a veil, a translucent cloth that he thinks of as poetry, or philosophy, that you lay over the world that allows you to find within standing reserve, within challenging forth, what we have become and find a way to image it, to witness it. And he and others have said, what perhaps can we do to the imminent destruction of 
ourselves as human beings, and this is where he and Benjamin, a radical communist, come up with almost the exact phrase, we can stand witness to our own self-destruction. And it is in standing witness that we become productive and perhaps uh, we manage to save ourselves. Standing witness rather than building means perhaps not doing anything or more radically doing no thing. And a lot of the most interesting images that you've also been seeing here are images of artists and architects who have produced no thing, nothing, who have engaged in unbuilding rather than building. I was very inspired by the work of Gordon Mother Clark, trained as an architect at Cornell, worked as an artist, started taking sawzalls to buildings and creating giant voids within structures. The notion that art is to be found by opening up the existing world becomes one way to reveal possible other worlds. The uh, architectural historian and philosopher Manfredo Tafuri said that that indeed was all that was possible, that all of modern architecture, and I stole a lot of the ideas I've been talking about from him, is nothing but the built affirmation of the bourgeoisie, the middle class, and all of its anxieties. And in the end, he says, what you get is an architecture that has accepted the reduction of its own elements to pure sign and the construction of its own structure as an ensemble of typological relationships that refer to themselves in a maximum of negative entropy, according to the language of information theory, cannot turn to reconstructing other meanings through the use of analytic techniques which have their origin in the application of neo-positive theories. Very dense, I realize that, but this notion that architecture reduces itself to almost nothing, to the making of just about uh, the, the only thing you can do, which is a void or a blank canvas or not making anything at all. Now, I'm realizing I've already gone on for an hour, so let me try to wrap this up a little bit. Um, in the book, uh, as I said, $39.95 at your local bookstore, cheaper on Amazon. Um, not that we should support Amazon, of course, but um, basically iterates a lot of different forms of explosion, veils, signs of nothing. Uh, one of my other favorites, which again I will now not quote, is Henri Lefebvre, who talks about how you impose, or the state imposes representations on all of us, whether it's laws or literature or architecture or politics and economics. And we try to make from ourselves representational spaces that from ourselves out are who we think we really are. But as soon as we bring them out into the world, they become the clothes, the wear, uh, we wear, how we appear, how we speak, how we make buildings, and they turn into representations. They are no longer ours. They are alienated from us. So, Lefebvre dreams of the space between the face and the mask, the place where representational expression, what you are, what we are collectively as a society, comes out and right before it's appropriated is something that becomes a kind of architecture. Uh, Lyotard, Jean-François Lyotard, says that the task of postmodern, what he calls postmodern art or architecture, to make, would be to make possible, to make, sorry, to make visible within presentation itself the impossibility of presentation, the realization that you can't actually represent anything, but you can make that impossibility itself present. You can also make it more palpable. The uh, architect Lars Lerup, working in Houston, uh, worked a lot with understanding what he called zoohemic clouds and getting a sense of the weight and the smell and the uh, wetness 
of a particular city as creating an atmosphere within which we create what he calls stims or moments of stimulations. I also worked a lot with those cultures that have to hide within our dominant culture and there produce modes of resistance and otherness that by their very nature have to be ephemeral because as soon as the state realizes them or they're appropriated, they disappear. Uh, my work 30 years ago was about queer space and by now queer space has become completely mainstreamed, I would say, or almost completely uh, mainstreamed. But succession after succession of other cultures whether they're racial or sexual or for whatever reason are excised from our culture, produce within uh, their hiding places the possibility of other words. And those come together in what Homer Bubka has described as an intersectionality, a community that can never be defined because exactly when it is defined, it disappears. And instead, you have to find a way to hide it rather than to build it. In more recent years, of course, a lot of this has become much easier to do, if you will, because you can create the infinitely complex and impossible to understand, but also continually changing, morphing worlds that the computer has opened up for us. And I was talking uh, in class today about how these kind of images have pervaded some of the best uh, cultural productions. I was citing uh, uh, Euphoria as an example outside of architecture, but certainly you can also find it within the realm of architecture. It's forms that are difficult to define, that never sit, sit still, that explode, that veil, that mumbo jumbo around uh, the world, that are behemoths and machines and, of course, AI cities all turned into one. And that is, in fact, uh, the cover of the book, which was produced by an uh, Italian architect working in Spain called Cesar Battelli, who read my text and turned it into this uh, form of a possible other world. The danger, of course, is that such worlds are immediately and continually appropriated. So. The challenge that the monster Leviathan ultimately asks is whether it is possible to not propose utopias or dystopias, but also not to serve and protect and solve problems, but instead to make architecture that is almost not there, that continually explodes that is a critical bath of acid, that is an all-white or an all-dark sign, that is a hole opened up within the city, that is a reuse or reimagination of the world we always have in such a manner that we can imagine, even if we can't build, a possible other world that is more sustainable more just, and more beautiful. And I hope that all of you will find some inspiration towards such worlds in uh, the thick pages and many footnotes of this book. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, you know, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, went, I went into a bit of a rabbit hole when I first started working on it, like, because, of course, the Bible. Okay, I have to read everything there is about the Bible. Um, and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was the son of a minister, uh, so he certainly knew his religious imagery. Um, 
the more I studied, the more I came to realize that I don't think that Frank Lloyd Wright cared for anything other than the imagery of just the giant beast. Um, what's interesting is that the, um, uh, the name, the, the description, uh, was also used by Hobbes to describe the modern state um, and to describe it as something that, again, depending on how you read it, was horrible or necessary or both. Um, so, yes, it has religious overtones, but I don't think that either for Frank Lloyd Wright or for me, um, the, the Christian or the Habensian overtones are, are necessary. Um, you know, it's, it's it, it, I could have used, or he could have used, whale or anything of that sort, but part of the point of the Leviathan is that it is so unknowable. Uh, it's a kind of monster in which you're not sure what it's made of. At, at one of the quotes in the Bible even implies that it might be made out of rocks. It might be made out of the earth uh, rather than being a, a living being. So it's more like a, the golem in, in the Jewish tradition. And almost every uh, religious tradition has a, a strange Leviathan like that. Good question, though. I, I, you know, I, I, at some point, I'll take all my research about that and the, the imagery of the Leviathan uh, in going back to the, at least the Middle Ages and, and do an article or something on that. Good one. Uh, yeah, but yeah. It felt like my Moby Dick, but yeah. So I recognize a lot of this is obviously theory, right? Uh, but have there been any notable, like, practical, like, movements or, I don't know, architecture or um, just, like, spaces in time that you didn't have accomplished that? Like, so, Sorry? No, you're yeah. good. Yeah, you got yeah. it. Um, yeah, some of the, the things I... Well... Let me be honest here. One of the reasons I didn't want to talk directly about the images mm -hmm. is because also in the book, I do not cite some of the specific things you've been seeing as here's one that worked. Yeah. Um, because the whole point is that there certainly have been wonderful communities or um, collages like... Um, the um, the one in Detroit that I showed um, and called the Heidelberg Project, or the kind of work that Theaster Gates has done on the south side of Chicago, or um, there, there's a wonderful kind of uh, community in Chile uh, that's an, called the Open University uh, that has some of those qualities, but of course as soon as they persist, they're appropriated and they become official works of art. So the whole point is that they uh, exist and disappear rather than being built continually. You know, Gordon Mother Clark's work, which is probably more inspiring to me than anything, um, never persisted. You know, it was always meant to disappear, uh, and all that remains is, a, is the photograph. Same with... Uh, oh, th right, this one, Mariam Tailwinds, who's a, an artist who goes to buildings that are going to be torn down either by the wrecking ball or, in the case of Palestine, by the Israeli army, and collects the material together and builds an alternate reality that she knows will be torn down the next moment. Uh, and so the photographs become what is actually the architecture, if you will. So it has to, by, by its very nature be ephemeral and fleeting and sort yeah. of hidden. Almost finding that, that value in its ephemerality. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. Which is also a self-justification for doing a theory.